Good evening. Well, on behalf of the FIFDH uh, Festival, I'm delighted to, to welcome you on this platform. Perhaps next year we'll be able to see each other face to face. But uh, this is a debate uh, co presented with the Service Agenda 21, Vue Durable of the uh, uh, authorities in Geneva in the context of the Equality Week um, and uh, jointly hosted uh, by the Office for the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Violence. So this is uh, following a film called Coded Bias by Shalini Kantaya, an exceptional film which is available until the 14th of March. Sunday, and I recommend the film highly. I invite you to see it over the platform. And it shows very convincingly how algorithms, contrary to what uh, we might believe and what I believed at any rate, uh, are not neutral. Um, they are uh, influenced by the biases uh, of uh, the people who programmed them. Um, so, uh, um, they struggle to apply to racialized people and women. Um, so on this uh, International Women's Day, this is a very suitable topic. And the, the discussion will be uh, moderated tonight by Mehdi Atmani, a freelance investigative journalist who specializes in the new technologies. Um, he's an independent uh, journalist who won the Swiss Press Award last year in 2020 for a web series, which is still available, by the way, on uh, the RTS platform or on YouTube, um, Switzerland Undercover. Uh, La Suisse sous couverture, and I recommend that as well. So I won't uh, take up any more of your time. I hope you enjoy the discussion. It's important to be able to write about violence with the same intimacy with which I write about love. We created the kind of community that allowed us to give expression to our dignity. Black lives matter. African young people. Actually, I'm not a hero. Bonsoir à tout le monde. Merci d'être ici en cette journée particulière. Cette journée particulière où, sans mauvais jeu de mots, on va parler de, de cuisine. Pas de cuisine alimentaire, mais de la cuisine des algorithmes. Qui sont ces fameuses recettes de cuisine où on ajoute du sel, du poivre. Et finalement, ces algorithmes, on leur dit ce qu'il faudrait faire pour nous, pour nous délester le poids de notre quotidien de femmes et d'hommes connectés. Ces algorithmes uh, qu'on a they control more and more areas of uh, daily lives. And uh, many of these algorithms are devised in uh, the United States or in China. And they dictate our um, lives uh, all over the world um, here in 2021. They do what uh, the programmers told them to do. Um, but very often, they've been programmed by white, heterosexual, uh, American men. And our lives more and more depend on these algorithms. Um, and for women, uh, for black or homosexual people, um, are we really uh, represented by these algorithms? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about these, uh, these so-called so neutrality of these algorithms. And we're going to discuss this uh, topic with three experts. And I'm delighted to welcome them here. Um, one here with me, and then two uh, via uh, the internet. Isabelle Collet, who is professor in uh, sciences of education, specialist in gender at the University of Geneva. 
In Berlin, uh, we have uh, Julia Kloiber, who is a uh, co-founder of uh, Superlab, a feminist think tank uh, for uh, inclusive uh, technological development. And then we have uh, Teresa Scantambolo, who is a researcher at uh, Venice University, um, interested in ethics and uh, artificial intelligence. So a very good evening. My first question is that algorithms are not neutral. Uh, you uh, are researchers, professors, women. How do you see the neutrality or the so-called neutrality of algorithms? Well, I think you'd have to be very naive to think that algorithms uh, were ever going to be neutral because uh, they are programmed by people. And as you said, um, we don't have a very inclusive society. We have a digital society um, which is defined and devised uh, by white, generally heterosexual, uh, um, wealthy uh, American uh, men. So it would have been very surprising if any of these algorithms have been neutral. And none of the developers, programmers of algorithms um, necessarily intend to exclude parts of the population. Um, but um, they just reflect their biases. And you have a dominant group in society who believes that everything, is what they think is universal. So if you explain things a little bit, what does an algorithm do? Um, I refer to uh, a cookery uh, recipe um, when you devise an algorithm. But if I was Facebook or Apple uh, and I wanted to um, develop a, a recipe, uh, if I put more pepper in or more salt in, I would get something different. Uh, how do I program these algorithms? Well, some algorithms you can um, predict very easily uh, what they're going to do. If you have a very clear list of ingredients and you know what those ingredients are going to give you. Um, however, there are also algorithms uh, based on artificial intelligence which are much more complicated than that because you put so many different data in there and then you ask the algorithm to do these statistical calculations uh, itself. And they may be extremely uh, complex based on probability, uh, very long um, uh, and complex sums, which are done, of course, very quickly by the artificial intelligence. But um, uh, it's deep learning, big data. Uh, these expressions tell you that uh, there, are, there is so much data here that it's impossible to explain how it works. It's like a black box. You put a lot of data in and you just trust it to give you something in return. But you don't know what you expect. The quality of uh, the data you get out depends on what you put in. And very often the data you put in are just a reflection of the world in which we live, which isn't, of course, perfect. Um, it's um, full of uh, homophobic, uh, racial, and sexist biases. So the digital society in which we live, uh, does it reflect the physical biases of our societies, or does it extrapolate them? We saw with the election of uh, Donald Trump um, that a lot of people um, based uh, their ideas on social media and uh, they received uh, information from people who thought like them. We aren't confronted necessarily to um, the other when we consult social media. So do these biases see uh, uh, their reflection in algorithms. Just to give you an example, um, if you have a de decision-making support system and you're a banker and you need to know whether you should be financing uh, a project uh, by a startup and you receive the information about that project, an algorithm is going to look at, how, uh, uh, at what the bank usually would think about in those situations. Um, what kind of profiles uh, of uh, projects would be approved, generally speaking. And the algorithm is going to see that, generally speaking, the bank doesn't trust projects um, uh, proposed by women as much as it does um, uh, those that come from men. And so the algorithm is then just going to duplicate what it's already seen. So it's not 
only going to advise people to continue to be biased, but it's going to develop those biases even further. So the advice that it gives um, is then going to become future data for future algorithms. So the algorithm is a reflection of our society. It's also a sort of magnifying glass because it's going to exacerbate existing biases. But the problem is that they have been devised by American companies, generally speaking, white men living in a particular social group. They don't reflect diversity. Um, so the data, uh, is that also a problem? Yes, you get the data which can influence you. In the public uh, sector, you have a literature um, from before 1950, and I'm very much uh, influenced by racism and sexism that existed at that time. And a lot of that data is being used uh, in um, the um, algorithms that we use to, uh, to study um, uh, study language. And if you look at uh, books from uh, before 1950, you'll see that um, very often the language used is extremely sexist and racist. Um, and the idea is that these algorithms are accessible to all. And what we've discovered is that if you look at how long it took to have health apps on our phones that look at the menstrual cycle, um, you see that uh, that took a lot uh, of time because um, programmers just weren't interested in that. There were only about 10% of programmers who were interested in menstrual cycles. So it took years and years before we started to see those apps on our telephones. And that bias comes directly from the fact that many of the programmers um, are from a homogenous group. I also wanted to hear from Julia Kloiber, um, who I can't see right now on the screen, but I hope that she can hear us. Julia and, and indeed Teresa. Good evening. Uh, Julia, a question for you. How do you um, see um, these biases in algorithms, Julia? You've worked in the film industry in New York, now you're in Berlin. Um, and you have a different perspective, and you work on detecting these biases and trying to correct them and trying to find solutions um, so that we can have an inclusive digital society. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think it's very interesting to not only talk about the algorithms and the artificial intelligence, but also about the data, because oftentimes when we, um, we have this uh, impression that data depicts the reality, right? But data, it also depends on who collects the data, for what reason, and uh, there can be a lot of, of bias in the data already. So this notion of that data is reality, I think this is something we have to uh, say goodbye to, and this is a very like important foundation to, to discuss. And then also, what are gaps in the data? Um, there is this book by uh, Caroline Criado Perez talking about invisible women. Um, I mean, something that many of um, you in the audience probably know is that um, in in the medicine, in, in a medical environment, like many tests, um, many uh, medicines have only been tested on men. Uh, we know way better uh, what the symptoms for heart attacks are in men than in women. So there's a lot of misdiagnosis and um, there's a data gap when it comes to the symptoms or there used to be a data gap. And uh, we need to fill these data gaps and we need to be aware of these data gaps. There's also really good project by Mimi Onua, a researcher from New York, and um, she made this art project uh, around an invisible collection of data. So also visualizing where are the gaps and uh, but where are also gaps that are uh, benefiting um, different uh, populations. So it's not always good to have the data on everything. Sometimes it can also be a benefit to not have data on certain things. But really talking um, more about uh, the notion of data, data and also what data is publicly available um, by our states, talking about open data and transparency, I think it's something very relevant in the context of um, artificial intelligence and algorithms. Julia was talking about data. 
And we also need something to talk about something which is very important and paradoxical uh, in today's world, and that is that as uh, digital women and, and digital men, we uh, see that there are new technologies uh, that can very much help us in our daily lives, but um, they need data in order to operate. And so this is the crux of, uh, of the problem, if you like. Um, AI algorithms, are they based on data that exclude many sections of the population, including women, uh, racialized people, um, just to name some of these groups. Um, now, moving on, I have a question for Teresa, who is a researcher and who is interested in the ethical um, implications of artificial intelligence. How do you see these biases in algorithms? How do we correct them? And how do we try to bring AI into a more inclusive reality by using data that um, reflects everybody and not just white men? Okay, so thanks, first of all, for inviting me in this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I would say that, first of all, uh, we are now talking a lot about AI, but AI has a long tradition and it's not just uh, about uh, deep, le deep learning. So there are many methods um, in the past uh, which um, don't need, for example, uh, all data and they don't need the amount of data that are uh, usually um, used for deep learning, which are um, working better if we feed the algorithms with a lot of data. Um, so this is the first distinction that AI is not, mm, is not composed of only uh, in neural networks, but are, there is a very uh, wide spectrum of methods. And second, I would say that this discussion on bias is very interesting because it is about not only gender bias, but it's about uh, um, di mm, discriminations in society and should uh, open and, mm, our uh, designing uh, methods and our design approach to a more inclusive society. And um, uh, there, are there are now uh, mm, several also discussions within the technical community, in particular the machine learning community, um, on uh, um, methodologies and techniques that can help us either to remove bias uh, from data uh, or to correct the algorithms uh, after the training. Um, so as we train the models and, uh, and we want to deploy the, the system. Uh, but uh, I think that technical solutions, um, uh, they, they are not enough. I mean, uh, they are uh, useful and we should uh, um, consider them because I think they can help us to detect biases, for example, but they uh, cannot be the only way to approach the issue of bias in, in our digital technology because uh, even as we uh, encode a fairness metric, for example, uh, we encode a particular notion of fairness. So uh, this is, of course, is a partial conceptualization, and there are many fairness metrics available, all uh, reflecting different views of uh, justice and fairness. So we need to uh, use these uh, technical solutions, but at the same time to uh, keep on uh, going with a conversation, an interdisciplinary conversation between engineers and computer scientists, and, but also social scientists, which can instruct and uh, better understand uh, um, the idea of justice in, in society. Coming back to the basics, internet is 30 years old, more or less. It was a crazy project to link everybody up all over the world. A utopia, almost, um, an egalitarian utopia. But actually, in 2021, we see the, the Internet is a source of exclusion and is actually a tool which is fragmented and is leading 
to um, bias and exclusion in many ways. What is your view um, as a researcher about this fragmentation brought about by the internet and these biases that uh, seem to be being exacerbated and uh, leading these people um, being cut off from one another? Do they prevent us um, from seeing minorities? Internet is something quite amazing, and that is that allowed for the Me Too movement um, to exist. Because I think that uh, without the social media, um, I, I just think uh, Me Too would have um, fizzled out. It would have remained it would have remained extremely local. It wouldn't have taken on the um, scope that it did. So as a result, women all over the world are more aware now of uh, harassment and uh, these issues, and they, they also have the opportunity to speak out um, over this vast network um, thanks to the internet. Of course, though, the internet is not perfect. I fully agree with you there. And it's not as free as we might think. The egalitarian utopia um, at the outset was that the internet should be free um, to users everywhere. OK, uh, anyone can um, connect to the internet, uh, create a website. Um, and the original idea, communication for all, um, in a sense, does exist. Um, but there are companies who um, make huge profits out of the internet and make huge profits out of the data that they obtain over the internet, including Google and Facebook. And so that is also uh, an aspect we cannot overlook. We shouldn't forget, though, that a lot of uh, social movements uh, have uh, grown in dimension thanks to the internet. This network that we use so often, uh, I wonder, is it also a source of emancipation uh, for people of color uh, and for um, women? I remember last year at the Glo Golden Globes, uh, American actresses uh, who were multimillionaires who uh, were asking to be paid uh, as much as uh, men in Hollywood. These were women asking to be paid as much as uh, men. Why haven't we seen this as much in the digital world. There seem to be um, different standards uh, in the digital world. Um, Julia, you've worked in the film industry. What do you think about that issue? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's either black or white. Um, I also, like, I agree with Isabel that the internet has huge potential. I mean, if, if, if it weren't for the internet, we wouldn't be on this panel now uh, remotely during a global pandemic. So it's been enabling us to communicate. It has been opening up knowledge, like just think of projects such as uh, the Wikipedia, um, a collaborative project that uh, enables people to access knowledge. But I think what an issue is, is that the internet uh, is currently dominated by commercial interests. Um, so companies dominate the internet and the ad industry, and of course they want to surveil and profile us so that they can serve us better ads. Um, they wanna, um, yeah, they wanna keep our attention on their platforms, um, um, YouTube um, algorithms, uh, the recommendation algorithms that try to serve you ever more extreme content so they, that you stay on uh, YouTube. But I think the, um, the potential of the internet is still there. We just have to figure out how to fight hate speech, how to fight misinformation, and how to uh, reimagine the internet in a way that it's not focused around commercial interests, but around interests of the society, of the people. Um, and I think that'll be very important in the future to create alternative narratives that counter um, the narratives of big corporations um, to free ourselves a little bit from these um, narratives and also from the constraints that come with them. But that's a good point. Uh, can we also criticize uh, this uh, digital hierarchy and this domination of uh, the patriarchy, um, this domination of companies and governments. Um, as a society, 
um, can we develop um, uh, a, a critique on that and, and develop a more egalitarian internet, Julia? I just tuned into uh, the Mozilla Festival and I recommend uh, people checking it out. And uh, the debate was around um, the global minority developing for the global majority. Uh, so the ones who have all the resources and the power developing uh, for those who lack the resources. So when it comes to um, the new technology, it's always a question of power and power shifts and also civil society organizations who are working towards these power shifts, who are coming up with alternative tools, alternative visions. Um, and sorry, I, I lost the, the train of thought. What was your question again? Yes, the question was really how to criticize, how to analyze this uh, digital patriarchy. As a society, do we have the tools um, to challenge that and to say, well, I can use social media, I can use the internet, but I don't want to be part of that um, digital um, patriarchy that exists today? Some of us might have the tools, so I'm working a lot with uh, civil society organizations, as I mentioned, who uh, serve as watchdogs, who observe what's going on, where they see discrimination, where people are disconnected. I mean, we still we, we have to, to think about the fact that a big percentage of the world's uh, population is not yet online, right? While we are already like going down the very dystopian um, road and train. So how do people who are coming online right now perceive the internet? Um, and um, what are the organizations out there, like in the movie with Joy Pulamwini, we saw the organization Big Brother Watch from the UK. Who are the civil uh, rights organizations and groups that are pointing out problems, that are fighting for legislation, that are doing strategic litigation on some of these issues? So I think um, not everyone has the tools, but we need to build stronger civil society organizations that have the tools in order to, um, yeah, work towards the interests of um, the majority uh, and um, society at large. And uh, a lot of these organizations still lack funding, lack resources, um, and um, many of them also lack resources to develop open source alternatives. I mean, Mozilla last year, I think, had to let go of a third of their um, staff again, um, and they are one of the privacy preserving open source browsers out there, um, the only one actually. Um, so we need to also think about um, maybe investing tax money into the development of these tools and uh, supporting civil um, society organizations, maybe also with tax money. Yeah. Uh there is always this great paradox. We are um, consumers of technology um, and new technologies are coming out every year. And then we don't necessarily have the time to digest them and to criticize them and to challenge them um, because that can take several years um, because uh, you need a certain amount of maturity and, and time to see the biases that exist in these technologies. And perhaps that depends on the fact that as human beings, we aren't necessarily trained or in a position to fully understand these new technologies that are coming out so rapidly um, uh, to take on our every, uh, take, take a, an ever increasing role in our daily lives. And perhaps the absence of uh, women in technology development um, is also a key point that we should mention again. If more women were involved in programming and in IT, then um, would we have a different perspective? Um, because it's only really men who've analyzed technologies before. Yes, if I could just reply to that, it's true, there are new technologies coming out all of the time and uh, things seem to be accelerating, but that's not necessarily a, a recent problem. What I mean by that is that facial recognition um, we've seen um, doesn't work uh, as well with black people, with Asians, and that's because 
um, to begin with, when facial recognition programs were developed, if you had an Asian looking face, then uh, very often um, uh, people trying to use them were asked to open their eyes properly. Um, otherwise, the technology wouldn't work. Um, that's because um, these programs were developed by white people and um, they were programmed to be used by white people. But uh, even before, um, with uh, traditional photography, black faces came out, um, it didn't always come out as well as white faces because the whole technology was developed by whites. And so this problem has been around for some time. And I think we have the same problem with AI. Um, but AI reacts more and more quickly, uh, uh, more quickly than ever before, um, even though it remains patriarchal in nature. So feminists are now becoming aware of the challenge and uh, um, anti-racist movements as well. And many of these uh, movements are effective thanks to these very social media that we're talking about. Well, what would uh, technology from a woman's perspective be? Well, I think my dream would be that uh, programmers were so diverse, oh, we couldn't even identify a male or a female perspective anymore because the programs were inclusive. You can also ask yourself, uh, if uh, women were uh, in charge of uh, politics, then maybe things would be different. My dream is that women and men together, um, if they are together, they come out with new solutions that they wouldn't have uh, ever come out with before if they were separated. Um, and this is true uh, of diversity in ethnic terms as well, because the outcome will be the result, uh, will be more inclusive, will be a new outcome. And that would be my dream, my technological dream, if you like. Because I think that would really transform our current world. As biases are being reflected in new technologies, are we also seeing the emergence of a technological uh, feminism, a critical perspective on technology that um, challenges uh, the perspective on technology that seems to be imposed on us since the beginning of the internet. Teresa, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, for sure, association and feminism uh, contributed to uh, enlarge, to open the perspective in uh, uh, traditional um, approaches, technological approaches. And, uh, uh, but this, of course, is not as I said before, it's not only about gender bias, but it's also about uh, um, uh, the inclusions of uh, diverse people and uh, consider uh, people um, uh, which are subject to uh, uh, the outcome of algorithms as uh, 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 human beings uh, with rights, which means that we consider uh, um, um, human beings uh, as women, as uh, as men, with their uh, as uh, as um, with their freedoms and free with their uh, political views, and we should respect all these dimensions of human beings. Um, we are moving. I I, I think. Uh, mm, uh, clear uh, somehow inputs or at least uh, um, a direction in uh, uh, recent development in the governance of AI uh, would move towards a more participatory design. For example, the ethics guidelines promoted by the Europe uh, by and uh, developed by the high level high level expert group uh, um, propose. Um, and recommend requirements uh, on uh, diverse and universal design, for example, and uh, um, a, a different approach and uh, participation of stakeholders. So all people who can be uh, affected uh, by directly or indirectly by these technologies can somehow 
record their voice and uh, um, uh, express their views that can be considered uh, in the design and the assessment of these systems. Um, so for sure, uh, the um, associations and particular uh, perspectives can help uh, in the, in the um, design of these systems of AI. But uh, uh, on the other hand, I think we should uh, engage more the public and, uh, um, uh, and help the public to, to be part of this wider discussion. And uh, allowing the mm, people, lay people, to better understand the AI capabilities, real AI capabilities, and, uh, and, uh, and hear your, their voice, basically. Yes, when we think about technologies and algorithms, we see that uh, what is holding us back um, is so um, challenging uh, that there are such powerful organizations behind some of these barriers um, that uh, as a society, we have difficulty dealing with these challenges. Um, very often, uh, women uh, are not uh, um, in decision-making roles in technological uh, corporations. Um, there are so many barriers. Um, so it's not a technical challenge. It's a political, philosophical, and societal challenge. I'd like to hear from you now about solutions, because you are all experts. You've been working for a number of years now on these questions. And so we're looking to you now for solutions, um, how to make the internet more egalitarian and how to promote the voice of uh, women, um, uh, be they programmers, uh, graphic designers, uh, or whatever. Julia, uh, turning to you, what solutions do you see in order to build a more inclusive digital society in the future? Yeah, and maybe before I come to the solutions, which I think is a very important part because we're oftentimes uh, talking about the problems, but I want to reiterate that acknowledging that most of the issues we're talking about are not technical issues, as you just said. They're systemic issues, and this is why there's no simple solution to them, right? An intersectional feminist lens can help us to better understand the complexity of the problem and can better um, help us understand different perspectives and also different layers of discrimination. I think this is also what uh, Teresa uh, was talking about, the intersectionality, the different layers of discrimination, because our identities are made up of, of different things, right? Gender, our se uh, sexuality, uh, religion, uh, so, and against all of these uh, can be discriminated by certain systems. And I honestly think that when we talk about a digital revolution, we also have to talk about a feminist revolution. So a digital revolution ha must be a feminist uh, revolution, to, to quote Francesca Bria there. And um, putting gender equality really has to be at the center if we um, want to see a more green, a more sustainable, and a more equal um, future. And this is something that um, many studies uh, show us. Um, and um, when you now ask me, like, what are ways to, to improve AI or what are solutions, I um, want to point to a report that, um, again, the Mozilla Foundation published around trustworthy AI. So what can trustworthy AI look like? And uh, one thing they talk about is that people should be able to decide how their data is used and what decisions are being made with the data. So who is using the data in order to do what? Because a lot of times when we talk about, talk, talk about these issues, we tend to generalize. But I think it's very important to discuss the different um, use cases and the different issues and not to not generalize uh, when we talk about this topic and throw around buzzwords. Um, and then to effectively address discrimination, um, we need to look closely as, at the goals um, and the data that fuel the AI. We've been talking about that before, like what data does go into the system, who is represented in those data sets and who is not. Um, and um, then there's also the issue of transparency, um, explainability 
of these tools, uh, also digital literacy on those tools um, in order to protect users, but in also in order to, um, to give them agency um, to have accountable systems and users that have agency and that can also um, challenge an algorithm or that can uh, appeal um, when um, an automated decision is, is been made that they don't agree with. Um, so I think these are all important components and we could talk for hours about each individual component, but I just wanted to list some and uh, maybe we have a chance to dive deeper into some of them. But I would also love to hear from Teresa uh, what she thinks about these different aspects um, since she's working and researching uh, the topic. Teresa, would that be... Teresa, uh, yeah, what would uh, you like to propose as a solution? Mentioned, mentioned uh, all the requirements, many of the requirements which are part of the project in uh, Europe to design a trustworthy AI, uh, uh, which means, as you said, to uh, make them transparent, to uh, allow to support human decision making, and also to consider the global social uh, impact, which includes also an environmental impact which is also underestimated, uh, but uh, all these aspects, so social discriminations, gender discriminations, and uh, um, communications about real and transparent and honest communications about AI, all these aspects are connected. I think this is the huge challenge. Um, otherwise, if we focus just one issue, uh, be that, being that uh, either the explainability or uh, the, the uh, discriminations or whatsoever, we are missing the point because as Julia said, uh, these systems are socio-technical systems. We are integrating technical capability with uh, social construct, which are because we are introducing all these algorithms in existing social infrastructure. Uh, so in our bureaucracy, for example, and uh, in uh, uh, processing to getting, for example, opportunity like education or work. And um, so I, I think that a key point is to consider, uh, to, to adopt an holistic approach and to consider all these dimensions, all these issues together. Um, so of course, it's a challenge. We are, there is no, I think, uh, unique solutions. It's a process requiring some kind of um, change of mindset, which is also a, a change in our business models and being transparent about what is the purpose of our uh, AI use within the a specific uh, business model. So um, I think this is a very, is a, is in, in, in the very end, is a cultural change that we need to, 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 to have. I have three questions to react to what you've just said. The first one is, and uh, this is a bit controversial, but I've always been told that if you want to understand how an algorithm works, you need to look into who devised it. As individuals, do we have the tools to challenge um, what we use on a daily basis? And here, this comes back to what I was saying about training. Uh, do we have the critical tools to identify the problems um, when we, for the, for the last 20 years, have delegated our lives to these um, systems that we rely on? Uh, what do you think about that uh, point, Isabel? Well, I uh, am a professor in sciences of education, so obviously I will tell you that education is the key. Um, I think that uh, IT has so much importance in our lives today. Um, we have chosen uh, for integration, social integration, to use social media and to use IT. And uh, technological development is accelerating more and more. Um, a lot of administration can no longer be done. Um, on paper um, without the internet. So it's absolutely vital to educate everybody, um, students, uh, children, and indeed adults, as to the digital environment. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be a programmer, but everyone needs to have the capacity. Everyone needs to have enough knowledge about the digital environment um, to be able to give a view on how it should be developed and implemented. What I think it's problematic today is that uh, very often 
when we talk about digital and IT at schools, very often you talk about the dangers of uh, the digital environment, fake news, uh, harassment, uh, cyber bullying, and those issues. But um, if you only focus on those issues when you talk to, it about, uh, to young people, you're not credible. It's like with sexual education. It's not about no, no, no. You also need to take a wider view. Children, um, we tend to think, uh, have grown up with uh, digital technologies, uh, so they know all about it. Uh, and uh, we, as uh, elderly people, uh, don't know as much as they do. But no, that's not the case. Uh, of course, nothing is innate. Uh, young people are not just born with uh, a digital awareness. Um, of course, they need to be educated. They need to learn uh, about the issues um, so that they are no longer just passive. You can like a video on YouTube, but you can also post something, you can also criticize something, and you can also choose which tools to use. Uh, you can decide what type of photos you put on, you, on YouTube, sorry, on Facebook. But it's important to know what we're doing and what is being done with those photos. Uh, and if you know that, then you can take uh, well-informed decisions. And this is digital education, and all of that still needs to be done. Um, look at the world before. Um, you know, fake news wasn't invented with the internet. You've always had fake news. Um, we had uh, the discussion about the Gulf War, for instance, and the so-called weapons of mass destruction. That was fake news at the time. And uh, we didn't have Twitter uh, at that time. So, you know, the digital environment has not invented fake news. It hasn't invented surveillance either. Um, it may have made it possible, um, created new possibilities, um, but you need to take a wider societal perspective of these problems and ensure that as individuals, we have the tools to express a view on how this is developed. Julia, you mentioned as a possible solution um, the need for a digital revolution. But as we said a moment ago, the problem isn't a technological one. Um, there are economic and political challenges. A lot of the algorithms that we use are in the hands of very powerful companies with links to uh, the very highest level in politics and administration. administration. Can we develop a new politics um, to change this? Yeah, because I think it cannot be only up to the individual, right? I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, people are homeschooling their kids, um, people just don't have the, the resources, the timely resources, at uh, the time resources in order to, I don't know, um, educate themselves on how algorithms work and how the different tools that they are using work. I think we need strong legislation that protects human rights, that protects our digital rights. We need strong watchdog organizations that are researching the different tools, that are flagging what's working and what's not. We cannot leave it. I think digital literacy is important, but we cannot leave this up to the individual because what we know is that minorities are mostly affected by these new technologies or they feel the repercussions as the first ones and those are groups who do not have the educate oftentimes the education or the financial resources in order to wrap their head around um, what these technologies do and do like a private uh, risk assessment at home with their kids i think that's a bit um utopian to 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 think that way and also unfair um, because it takes a lot of bandwidth and know-how in order to grasp um, what these individual systems are doing. And every one of us, we're living in the in the European Union. I mean, we've um, seen this with GDPR, right? We're all this, um, cl we're clicking away all these windows that are asking us, like, hey, can we take your data? And we're like, yes, yes, just give us the content. Um, so we also need to work on um, what does informed consent look like? And what does consent, informed consent, consent look like in a way that people really understand what is happening in the background without having to um, study um, a, a STEM uh, or a programming language. Um, so I think informed consent, um, good legal frameworks that protect our digital rights, 
and active watchdog organizations that um, surveil the surveyors, um, so to say, are crucial when we think about um, an equal and just internet or equal and just technology of the future. Well, I've received also a number of questions from um, the public. And one of them, uh, two questions in one, really. Do you see yourself as a militant in your uh, various respective areas? Well, that's a funny question. Very often people ask me if I'm a feminist, but I think uh, we've already gone ahead with our coming out, really, on that particular point. But uh, as a professor, I teach teachers, I'm a trainer of trainers, and when people ask me if I'm a, a militant, well, as a teacher, a professor, you are by definition a militant. If you want to combat uh, um, uh, people dropping out of school, then you need to teach the people and uh, you need to be a militant in that respect. So what I'm saying is um, I'm interested in um, um, spreading knowledge, and therefore I'm an activist. The current situation that we're facing in the digital world that we've discussed, um, is it now time to change gear and be more direct in our action? Julia talked about justice, um, but uh, justice isn't necessarily uh, effective in the digital environment. So do we need to change gear? Well, activism, you talked about uh, being more direct, direct action. Well, you may be taking things a little bit too far. The areas in which I'm trying to work on are encouraging more diversity in the digital world. Now, I know that that's not going to resolve all of the problems that we face. There are systematic, systemic challenges. We need legal reform. We need... Uh, monitoring and watchdogs, but encouraging more diversity in the digital environment, I believe, is a vital uh, tool. Before, we used to tell girls that it was important to um, be more involved in IT. And now we've realized that it's not just a question of talking to women or girls, it's a, it's a question of talking to institutions and telling them to be more inclusive. Uh, and by institutions, I mean schools, universities, companies. How do we reform these institutions to ensure that we no longer need to go and try to encourage women and girls to get involved in this environment? How do we reform the institutions to ensure that it takes place? I believe that that is one of the key battles that we face. We used to say, well, girls can't be forced to get involved in IT if they don't want to. Now we've realized that we need to reform institutions, and that's a question of changing gear. There's a question from Naomi. Uh, Julia, I would like to hear from you about that. Uh, Naomi asks, um, as we've identified these biases now, should we stop using the software that we are used to using? And should we create a new and more inclusive software? Is it now time to make that choice and to build software and alternative tools that correspond to the vision of the world that we have? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more um, when it comes to developing alternatives. And uh, a couple of years ago, I set up a, a funding program um, together with the German Ministry for Education and Science called the Prototype Fund uh, that ex is explicitly um, focusing on funding public interest tech. So what are technologies um, in the public interest? Uh, what do they look like? So, for example, we funded um, do-it-yourself air quality measurement networks and databases, or we funded um, tools for whistleblowers, um, or privacy, um, uh, private messaging apps, so privacy protecting messaging apps, um, or sign dictionary, a dictionary for sign language. So there's this whole variety of um, tools, also a lot of them um, 
very much focused on the needs of uh, marginalized groups and marginalized communities developed by them. Um, there's many of these ideas and many of the solutions already out there, but they need to be amplified. They need more resources and funding. Um, on In the US, there's a program called the Open Tech Fund, the Open Technology Fund that um, funds um, software that supports the freedom of speech on an international level. And uh, I think the European Union also needs something similar, maybe not only focusing on the freedom of speech, but focusing on the development of public interest tech. And uh, they are also setting a clear standard um, that um, the funding has to go to diverse teams, has to go to women-led teams as well as male-led teams. Because if we look at uh, who receives funding right now in Europe, then um, one of the latest studies says that um, um, out of $100, $92 are invested in European tech companies that are um, their founding teams that were all men. So I think we also have to restructure these um, funding programs in order to be able to develop alternative infrastructure. And there's um, one big project that uh, Germany and France are working on, Gaia X, um, an infrastructure project around uh, cloud um, software, cloud services, so that we're not like uh, that dependent on Amazon Web Services or other cloud providers anymore, but that we build um, independent digital public infrastructure. Um, and I think this will be a major topic for the years to come, um, also identifying what parts of infrastructure, what tools do we still lack or need, where are the gaps, and um, who already has visions and ideas out there, or who is already building them and needs more support and more visibility. So uh, I think that'll be very important. Thank you for the question. Une question de Alex, qui a question from Alex, who asks, who is benefiting from these biases? Are we talking about a form of economic domination by um, Chinese and Californian tech companies? Are we talking about governments who benefited from Who benefits from these biases? Well, what's interesting is that part of these biases um, don't benefit anybody. Because the technology is worse, um, less easy to sell, not as um, good um, as a result of these biases. If there were mixed teams responsible for developing these programs, then um, the technology would have actually been even more successful. So, since tech is developed by people with more purchasing power, you tend to exclude uh, huge sections of the population who don't have the same purchasing power and can't buy the tech. But this is a complex issue. There are biases that we weren't aware of, perhaps, when the product, product was developed. And then there are also biases that are conscious because um, companies decide that uh, things might be more profitable. Tinder, for example, was challenged uh, a few years ago now, um, two or three years ago, because they had a, a sexist and conscious bias um, as a, uh, an attempt to be more profitable. It, uh, focused on um, relations between a man uh, of a higher social standing to the woman uh, he was supposed to meet. So this was a model which it believed um, gave greater satisfaction um, to the clientele. So this was a voluntary, conscious, sexist bias that Tinder used in order to be more profitable, or so it thought. So some of the tech um, has unconscious bias, and some of it has conscious bias um, as a, an attempt to be more profitable. I also had a question, actually, for Teresa, and that is that we've talked a lot about who develops these algorithms uh, and AI. But another issue is that uh, aren't we always afraid that machines overtake humans and artificial intelligence 
draws on the data that we feed it and uh, ends up being more powerful than the people who have developed it. Is that a real risk uh, that you um, uh, consider in your work? Okay, um, this is uh, a good question. I mean, uh, there are some applications that are outperforming human uh, um, uh, uh, human performance. So, um, but these uh, great achievements, um, so these high performing uh, uh, systems are uh, examples of narrow AI. So actually, if you consider um, big successes like uh, um, the AI system built, for example, to uh, for AlphaGo and for the, Go, the game of Go and beating uh, um, uh, human uh, human beings in that challenging game, that game uh, and that AI as application is good and is uh, is high highly performing, but only in that case for that game. Uh, if you move in another uh, domain of, of application, that AI system is not working uh, as expected or, or at the same standard, and the same. In, uh, also uh, holds for um, applications in computer visions. So we have narrow applications um, developed for very narrow specific tasks. Uh, so in that case, I mean, uh, we can achieve very uh, high performance and, uh, and human beings, I think, um, should be instructed on uh, at least those uh, who needs to um, use the, 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 the algorithmic output for specific uh, domains, like for example in healthcare, should be instructed so as they can understand how, what is the functioning and uh, what is the accuracy uh, of these systems because uh, they are not magic. So it's very important because we can really make a difference in certain domains because there are very accurate uh, systems that can help us in taking and making better decisions. But at the same time, we need to be aware uh, that the final decision maker should be aware what are the real limits and what are the real capabilities. Um, so I think we should, this uh, is not, should not be taken as a risk of uh, machines that uh, uh, will replace human beings. I mean, this is a more uh, kind of, uh, mm, a science fiction in imaginary, we should be aware of systems that can uh, help us better um, uh, making to, to perform better decision making. On the other side, we should be aware of systems that can predict uh, some traits uh, of our behavior. And uh, for example, uh, if you consider the case of Cambridge Analytica, that can be in that case very powerful and very dangerous. So uh, if I uh, should mm, point to a risky application. In that case, I think uh, when we have AI system that can predict uh, some vulnerabilities of the users in that case and can do it uh, um, in a very accurate way, uh, we should uh, be very careful because in that case, if we use this system, for example, to predict, uh, to predict uh, the, the political view of a user, in that case, uh, uh, we, it's very important to understand who has the power and who who is uh, who is the owner of the system because that can use that 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 knowledge can be used for uh, uh, manipulate the people. So I think cas, hein, de, de le... that always that always ha is happening. Uh, everyone seems to know everything about everybody. And what you've pointed out is that algorithms and AI are also there to predict the future on the basis of data which we currently have to predict behavior or future um, life choices, um, decisions for companies. Um, it can be used to manipulate people and the way they think. I have a question um, based on that idea about personal data, actually. In 2021, in today's world, can we continue to operate on the basis of privacy? Can we protect data? Um, 
Is it possible? Julia, would you like to reply to that? Um, I really don't want to go down the super dystopian road. I think it's it's uh, possible to protect uh, privacy if we're using the right tools, if we're um, putting a strong um, focus on it, also on a, on a legal basis or, the, or on a legislative basis. But then even if you are protecting yourself, even you are even if you as an individual are not on Facebook, if you're not on uh, social media platforms that um, tr are trying to uh, take as much data and analyze it, even then like the systems can infer certain things about you because your friends, your family are on these platforms. So I think we have to move, when we think about the concept of privacy, we, I think we have to move from looking at it as like a concept that's shaped around individuals to a concept that's, um, that uh, affects the collective. Um, Marit Yeshak uh, wrote a really nice uh, article together with Martin Tisney about um, collective harm of um, data and the, the effects um, that it can have on the collective. So even if you're protecting yourself, um, bad decisions or like your family members being on certain platforms and sharing data with these platforms can um, have negative effects on you because things can be inferred. Um, so what they suggest in this paper, as far as I remember, is legislation that also focuses on these collective harms when it comes to privacy and not only indivi uh, on the individual. So I think this could be a way forward to looking at the collective and um, how um, we can protect the privacy of the collective and then ultimately also of the individual. Mais quel est so finalement le, the paper as well. quel est finalement le, le libre arbitre de, 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 de chacun que is it up to each individual? Uh, can we do things differently um, in order to overcome these biases? Or are we prisoners of these social media and these tools that we use? I don't think we are necessarily prisoners, um, at least as much as people would like us to believe. You can be resigned to the situation and say, well, uh, we can't do anything about this. Uh, these companies know everything about us and there's nothing we can do about it. But there was a documentary that I saw on Netflix um, behind smoke screens, I think it was called. But it was very interesting because it heard from a number of uh, ex-GAFA millionaires who said, we hoped really to make a better world. That's what they believed they were doing. And then we uh, were caught up in our own game, in our own, own algorithms, and we became addicted to the tools that we were creating. And uh, if we became prisoners to the technology, then you have, you're, you're bound to become prisoners as well. But no, I don't believe that because there's a very big difference between them and us. They believed very strongly in their technologies, but we're not all as naive as that. And we don't necessarily all think that these tools such as Facebook and Twitter are going to be our salvation and are going to make our lives better. We just don't all believe that. So I think all of us uh, have some personal agency. Um, and I don't think we are necessarily prisoners of these uh, social uh, media tools. We all need to be very vigilant about how we share data. That goes without saying. And the way we use digital tools. Um, but even if we're very, very careful, uh, yes, it's true that uh, these companies can still infer things about us. But nevertheless, I do believe that we remain uh, in charge, we remain responsible for our decisions, and we can all uh, fight for a more uh, uh, accessible uh, and inclusive internet. We're here in Geneva, uh, where there are a number of organizations working on internet-related issues. There's a question from Pierre, who asks, shouldn't we ensure that uh, these issues connected with algorithms and the digital environment are dealt with uh, by international organizations, like uh, we deal with human rights. Shouldn't there be a world 
digital organization protecting the neutrality of algorithms? Well, there is an association uh, called uh, um, La Quadrata du Net, um, which tries to do that. And, uh, and actually, the European Union considers that the right to internet is like the right to uh, drinking water uh, and other uh, fundamental rights. And uh, I, I think the other experts may know more about this than I do, but I think this is the direction we're going in. Um, even though we may not be moving in that direction fast enough. Um, we are moving towards a rights-based approach. Julia, what do you think about that? Yeah, the European Commission is working on many of these topics, but as we all know, like legislation moves slower than a technological development. Um, so I think this is... Um, I don't have an answer to how to, to bridge this um, because I'm not working um, in tech policy specifically, uh, but there's many uh, bright minds thinking about this. And I mean, we're living in in, in democracies. I think this is something we shouldn't forget. Um, um, the power is um, defined by the people. So um, also always like uh, reassessing the, the parties that you're voting, like what is their um, digital agenda? Um, are they pro um, a pro a privacy protecting tools? Are they pro encryption or do they have a different agenda? So I think it's up to the people to vote for parties that protect their um, digital rights and um, so that it's not only up to civil society organizations or the goodwill of companies. Um, in, in China, th that's a diff there's a different picture, but here in Europe, we're still living in democracy. So I think um, there's legislative power um, that um, can confront these companies and that can ensure that uh, the rights of the citizens are protected. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Um, this brings us to the end of our debate this evening. Uh, Julia, thank you very much in Berlin. Teresa, thank you uh, for having participated in the debate. And Isabel, thank you um, for your contributions as well. And thank you to everybody for having followed the debate. Goodbye.